This is part two of our lecture on the Mongols and Ming. In part one, we had talked about the rise of the Mongols and its spread across Asia, um, the Khanates that it created as um, the Mongol Empire split up after the death of Genghis Khan. So today we're going to talk about, take a more in-depth look at the Khanates. So the first one we're going to do is the Khanate in what is today we would call Russia. So it's called the Khanate of the Golden Horde. So let's do a little bit of uh, pre, pre-Mongols. So before the Mongols came into Russia, what will be Russia, um, there was, as you can see in this map, there was all of these different local kingdoms. It was very what we would call feudal. We'll talk about feudalism when we get to our lecture on Europe, but basically it's where the land is divided up into uh, kingdoms or principalities or big, big pieces of land. Um, and each one is ruled by a prince or a king, however you want to call it. Um, all They control the warriors, and the warriors then supervise the peasants. And so it was very decentralized. There was no one ruling power in this part of the world. It was all of these separate little states kind of running their own lives. And so when the Mongols come in, there's, there's nothing to stop them. There's no united front to stop the Mongols from coming in and conquering the whole area. All right. So what, we, what happens during the Mongols is when the Mongols come in and invade, they conquer everything, but the Mongols are not keen on administering their, an empire, right? Um, they're more about conquering and pillaging and plundering and, and taking things, and they're in it for the wealth, right? Um, and so they don't want to do the mundane day-to-day -day passing laws, seeing if the taxes are collected and that kind of stuff. So what they do is they pick one of the princes in this area, and it just so happens to be the Prince of Moscow, which is a small um, kingdom um, that, we can, that we see in this part of the world. And it's just like, we're going to pick you, right? So you're going to be the prince in charge. So while we're off conquering and pillaging and plundering and doing our Mongol thing, right? We, are, we want you to go around and collect what is called tribute. Um, tax is when you collect it on a daily basis, um, which you need a big government structure to do. You need lots of government workers to, you know, when people are making a trade or something, tax it. But the Mongols are not interested in day-to-day -day operation, and so they're more into what's called tribute. Like once or twice a year, we're going to come back and we want our money then. You don't have to have much of a bureaucracy to do that or a government structure. You just come and collect it once or twice. Um, and so the Mongols are going to choose the Prince of Moscow of one of all of these principalities you see in the map. And they're going to say, you're responsible for going around and collecting the money, the tribute. And when we come back once a year, um, we're going to get our money directly from you. And I'm just going to here to let you know that if you don't have all the money, I'm coming to you. So you better be motivated to go to all the other principalities and get the money. And so then they leave and they go off and they do their thing, right? So this is, this is going to make tax collection or tribute collection a lot easier for the Mongols. Now, as time goes on, uh, 10 years past, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, 100 years, as time goes on, all the other principalities just get used to handing their money over to the Prince of Moscow. Um, and so the Prince of Moscow develops this sense of position and authority as the first among all the other principalities. Um, and so he gets into this leadership role. And so this is kind of centralizing Russia. Unwittingly, the Mongols didn't set out to do that. It's just the process they use as time goes on. The Prince of Moscow is going to get a little bit richer. He's going to skim a little bit off the top, right? And also the other princes get used to, you know, paying him money. And so eventually, right, we're going to see that um, the Prince of Moscow is going to be a very powerful man within Russia. Now, the other principality that's emerging as a powerful principality is the principality of Kiev, which we see down here. And Kiev is because it's more on the trade routes, right? Um, we see that the Silk Roads go all over the place, but um, the Prince of Kiev is closer to some of these these Silk Roads, and so just by natural controlling trade, um, he's going to build up a power base and he's going to get wealthy as well. And so we have these kind of two very powerful emerging principalities. The Principality of Moscow, because they're put in charge by the Mongols, and then Kiev as well, just because they're closer to the trade routes. And so we see that Russia is starting to become more and more centralized, unified, instead of all of these separate little kingdoms. Now, eventually, um, we will talk about in the future, um, in, our, in our next unit as well, but also at the end of this unit, how the Mongols are going to start to collapse. And when they, when they start to weaken, that encourages the Prince of Moscow. He sees his chance to overthrow these, these overlords that have come in and imposed foreign rule on them. He has the money. He has the leadership. Um, and so he is going to lead a rebellion of the princes of uh, Russia, and they're going to overthrow the Mongols. Now, this is going to be slightly 
slightly into the next time period, um, but we'll talk about it here because it's just over the time period um, after um, 1450. And so he will naturally emerge as kind of the leader of, of Russia, right? Now, all of these other principalities, why should they do what the Prince of Moscow says? Well, one, we said that he's already kind of in a position of leadership because of how the Mongols put him in charge. So they naturally look to this position for leadership. But also, um, the Prince of Moscow uses Christianity to centralize his power as well. Um, he picks Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, from, from Greece and the Byzantine Empire, and he tries to get everybody else to convert to it. And then he says that um, God has chose me to be your leader, right? And so this religion gives him the, um, the authority, the legitimacy to, to run them. And so these are kind of the dual things that this prince of Moscow is using to rise above all the rest, right? He uses his position that the Mongols put him in, and then he uses that to rebel. And then he also cements his leadership by saying that he is, um, he is God's chosen person to rule this area. And then the final thing he does is he marries into, he has his family marry into some of the ruling families of the Byzantine Empire. Now the Byzantine Empire, we haven't talked a lot about, but we will in the future. The Byzantine Empire is a continuation of the Roman Empire that goes back a long time. And the Roman emperors were called Caesars. Um, and so what happens is when the Prince of Moscow has his family marry into the Byzantine Empire, he can also claim legitimacy, not by just religion, but he can also claim legitimacy because he says that, look, my family now is going all the way back as rulers to the Roman Empire through the Byzantine Empire. And so he starts to call himself Caesar, but in Russia, it's Tsar. And so that's how you kind of translate it. And so this is how we get this title for the rulers of Russia as Tsars. Right. Um, so the so let's give you some specifics. So the leader, the Prince of Moscow, that does organize this rebellion around 1500, just over the period break of 1450, is Ivan the Third. And we this is this is one way how to spell czar. You can also spell it C Z A R. And you know, again, it's trying to give legitimacy that not only am I the leader of your religion, not only have I overthrown the Mongols, but also right, I am tied to in some kind of family related way, going all the way back to the Romans. Caesars. And so these are all the ways that you know, the Russia kind of unifies at this time. And so now let's move on to the south of Russia. Let's go to the Ilkhanate of Persia that's established. So we had talked about in part one of this lecture that the Mongols are going to come in here into Southwest Asia and to overthrow the Seljuk Turks. So they're going to replace the Seljuk Turks. So now we have Mongols in charge of this part of Southwest Asia that is Persia or what we call modern day Iran mostly. All right. Now, once again, the Mongols don't really know how or are not interested in collecting taxes. And so what they do is they collect tribute. And so the Mongols come in, conquer the Seljuk Empire, put Mongols in charge of provinces. But for the most part, they look like we're just going to come once a year, maybe twice a year and collect money. That's tribute because... Again, taxes are something that's collected on a day-to-day -day business, and you have to have a large bureaucracy that's educated to kind of keep track of all that and collect them every day. But that's just not the Mongols. And so they're going to collect tribute once in a while because um, they're not really interested in governing. They're more interested in, in conquering at this point. Um, and so that's how they kind of set up their state. Right? Now, the Mongols, they are going to introduce new ideas into Southwest Asia. If you remember, the Mongols have conquered parts of China, and in the Song and Tung dynasty, they had developed the idea of paper money or flying cash. And that was a way to expand the economy, to print more money than we just have gold for, um, and so we can do more transactions. We're not limited by the amount of gold and silver that we have in the economy. We can actually now print more money, and more people have more money, so they can buy more things. The economy speeds up, gets better. Right? We can collect more tribute. And so they introduced that idea of paper money from China all the way over here into Southwest Asia, into the Ilkhanate of Persia. And so they say to the people of Persia, we're going to do paper money. Right? Um, however, it doesn't go so well because this is not really a centralized empire, the Ilkhanate of Persia. Remember, we're just they're just there for tribute. They don't really know how to run a government. They're not interested in running a government. And so we can't force the people like we can in China, who's used to centralization. We can't force them to adopt this paper money. We say you will, but they reject it. The, the merchants in Persia are like, you can't 
you can't force me to use this paper money. It's just paper. It's not gold. It's not silver. It doesn't really have any value. And so people reject the paper currency. Plus, people start printing counterfeit currency because it's just paper. Um, and so the economy is really going to start to fall apart and break down. And this is going to be a reason why the Ilkhanate of Persia does not last long. Right? Over time, the Mongols have to find a way of legitimizing their rule. They have to find a way of convincing the people of Persia that we're not outsiders, that we are legitimate rulers of you. And so what they do is they convert to Islam um, because they think that if we're Muslim, then all of our Muslim subjects will be more willing to listen to us. Um, and so here we have the conquerors kind of becoming like the conquered in order to legitimize their power. And so both here in the Ilkhanate of Persia and in the Golden Horde, we're seeing religion is used as a way to gain legitimacy, to get the people to believe that you should do what we, the rulers, say. All right. Their decline, we've talked about, is because of economy, but also because what we've talked about in previous lectures, Muslim empires at this time have a real problem with succession. Right? When the current sultan or leader dies, Who's the next person? Well, in other parts of the world, like in Europe, they use this thing called primogenitor. Firstborn son inherits, and it's very easy. We know who the first, next person's going to take over is. is the oldest son of the dead ruler. But here in Muslim empires, we just don't have that tradition. Um, and so what happens is, um, just like in any other Muslim state at this time, the Muslim ruler, even though he's Mongol, he's converted to Islam and adopted a lot of the cultural practices, he's going to have a harem. He's going to have four legitimate wives that are legal, and then he's going to have a whole bunch of concubines, you know, hundreds maybe of women that are not girlfriends, but they're not wives. They're somewhere in between. And so they, the um, sultan or the leader of the Ilkhanate of Persia could have hundreds, literally hundreds of sons. And they don't have the tradition of the oldest son taking over. Um, and so when the sultan dies or is assassinated, um, there's this big power struggle on who should be the next ruler. And it's, it's brother versus brother. And they're all stepbrothers, but brother versus brother. And so we have every so often this big civil war that happens in a Muslim empire like the Ilkhanate of Persia. And that further tends to weaken the, the state from inside. And so this is just something that all of these Muslim states at this time have, um, that they just don't have a solution to figure out how to overcome. And so it will weaken the empire over time and eventually it will fall. All right, so now let's go to the last Ilkhanate we're going to talk about, um, and it's in China. And so when Genghis Khan died, remember they divided up the empire into these four big Ilkhanates, and we've talked about the Golden Horde, and we've talked about the Ilkhanate of Persia. We're not going to talk about the one in the center too much. Um, and so now let's talk about um, what over here is in East Asia. And so Kubla, um, Genghis Khan's grandson, a guy by the name of Kublai Khan, he's a great powerful um, military leader, and he is going to invade what's left of the Sung Dynasty. If you remember the Sung Dynasty, what was left of it, that hadn't been conquered by previous nomads, um, had moved down here into the southern part of China. And so Kublai Khan is going to come in, and he's going to conquer um, and take it over. Now I'm going to skip to the next slide just to show you a picture real quick, and then we'll come back. And so this is so here's here's the Mongols coming in. Notice they have their camels and horses from Central Asia, um, and they are way outnumbered by the Chinese. And so how are they going to conquer the Chinese? Well, they're going to use the Chinese high population against themselves. And so what they do is they invade the southern Song part of China. They spread terror uh, uh, among them, like they slaughter everybody they possibly can, which creates the Song Chinese to be just terrified, and they rush into the cities for protection behind the walls. And this was a purposeful tactic by the Mongols. And so with all of these people cramming into the Chinese cities, then we laid siege to the city. So the Mongols surround the cities, and we don't even have to charge the city, right? What we do is we now this Chinese city is overpopulated, so they run out of food quickly. And they're going to see disease spread quickly as everybody's crammed in, right? And then the Mongols are also going to throw um, diseased cows and animals in to help spread the disease. They're going to adopt the use of this thing called the trebuchet. It's this catapult you see right here. And that's how they can throw ca an dead animals in to spread disease. Or as we can see here, they're going to light things on fire and spread it in and cause fire to go in this overpopulated city. And so it's a very intelligent, if ruthless, way of conquering these, these Chinese cities is we just, you know, create terror, 
and the peasants are going to flood into the city, and then we're going to use China's population against itself. And so this is just one tactic they use to kind of take over. And so let's go back to the previous slide now. And so, so the Kublai Khan and his Mongols conquer the rest of China. So no more Song Dynasty. It is gone. It's replaced by the Yuan Dynasty. Now the Yuan Dynasty is the ruler, is the new dynasty in China, but it's not Chinese. It's Mongol. And so when we talk about the Mongols in China, it's just called the Yuan. Um, just like when we talk about the Mongols in Russia, it's called the Ilkhanate of the Golden Horde. Here it's just called the Yuan Dynasty. And it's not a very long-lasting dynasty, is it? It lasts in less than 100 years. Um, and so we're going to talk about how they administer the state, and then they're going to talk about how they quickly leave. All right? And so when the Yuan come in, they have disdain for the Chinese because we are the conquerors, right? And they are the conquerees, right? We have conquered them, and so we must be superior to them. And they don't look at they look at the Chinese as these settled people, these farmers that aren't very good horsemen. I mean, like, you know, like well, these people are horrible. Why would we want to associate with them? We conquered them. We're the rulers, and so they reject assimilation. Unlike the Mongols in Persia, they say you know well, they're going to forbid their people for interacting and assimilating into Chinese culture because we're superior, and so they say no foot binding of Mongol women because that's a Chinese thing, and we reject all things Chinese because they are, at the time, they, we would say that they're weak and they lost to us, so why would we want to become like them? They also say that we can't marry, um, in, intermarry, so no Mongols are going to intermarry with the Chinese people. Um, they outlaw learning Chinese languages, adopting any Chinese culture. We are going to keep ourselves separate and reject assimilation because we are superior. And we're not going to let Chinese people learn Mongol language or culture because they're not worthy. And so we have this kind of interesting administration of the state where they're rejecting the people and separating themselves from the people that they have conquered. However, we still need to rule them. I mean, China is a very big place. It could generate a lot of web revenue for us. And so we take out all of the upper Mandarin scholars, the, the Chinese um, Confucian bureaucrats at the top levels. We'll let them stay at the, at the city level. We'll let them stay at the village level um, because we just don't have enough people to replace all of the Confucians. Um, but we are going to take out the provincial level, right? And so the highest placed, Hmong, the, the highest placed Chinese Confucianists are going to lose their jobs, which of course they're not happy about. Now, who are we going to put in charge of these provinces? Well, we're not going to put anybody Chinese in charge because one, we think they're inferior, and two, they're going to look as, as often as possible to rebel, and so we're not going to give them power. And so we put either Mongols in charge of these provinces, or we put people that we have conquered from other areas, maybe Arabs from all the way over here um, in West Central Asia um, and in Persia, right? So maybe here, or maybe here where there are Muslims. And we're going to bring those Muslims or Arabs in, um, and we're going to give them high positions of power. And they're going to be loyal to us because we gave them this position of power, and so they're not going to rebel because then they'd lose all their position and power again, right? Maybe we'll bring in Christians from over here, um, if from Russia, right? Um, or maybe we'll bring in Nestorian Christians from over here in kind of West Central Asia. And so we're going to bring them in. And again, they're fo we're bringing foreigners in because we think we can trust foreigners to run the provinces because we're giving these foreigners everything they have, power, position, uh, money. Um, and in, re in return, right, we're buying their loyalty. In return, they'll be loyal to us because we don't think we can trust the Chinese. Also Persians from over here in Persia. And so all of these things, we're going to kind of bring in these foreign, we're outsourcing the government and we're going to bring in these foreigners. A great example of this is this Italian. Um, his name is Marco Polo. There's some debate if he actually made it to China, but for the people who do think he did go to China, um, he is going to befriend Kublai Khan. Um, and he is going to be put in charge of a big section of China as one of an example of these foreigners who are going to come in um, and rule parts of China for the Mongols. So no more civil servant system as far as the highest levels. All right. Now, the Mongols, they have freedom of religion. The Mongols understand that they have a huge empire, and if we were to pick one religion over another, we'd have religious wars on our hand, and that would become disruptive, and it would tear apart this huge empire. You know, because we have we have some Buddhists that we're running, and that we are supervising, we have Confucianists and Taoists, and over here we have Christians, and we have Muslims, and if we were to say this is the one religion, you know, we'd have huge religious wars. And so the, the Mongols say, like, you know, religious freedom for everybody. Whatever you want to be, you can be. 
And so um, we're going to see that now as we're bringing foreigners into China, well, they're going to want to still practice their faith. So we see Christians in China, mostly Nestorian Christians. We're going to see Muslims in China. Here's a crescent moon. So we're going to see Moss in China. And so we're going to see all of these different faiths, foreign faiths, come into China during this foreign rule. And then we've, we're just going to continue this idea. We've talked about this before. Even though the Mongol Empire is divided up into these four areas, it's in their interest to continue the Silk Roads. And again, the Silk Road is not any one road. It's a whole bunch of different trade routes that we just kind of collectively call, these are supposed to be trade routes, that we just kind of collectively call the Silk Roads. And goods are going back and forth across the Silk Roads, and so we're going to make sure we protect the trade routes because it's in all of our benefit, every Ilkhanate, um, it's in all of our benefit to keep trade going so we can tax it and make money off of it. All right, so let's now do the decline of the Han because as we had said on the previous slide, it doesn't last even 100 years. So the Mongols are living the good life, right? They want to keep themselves separate from China. They want to continue to ride horses. They want to continue to live in tents. Yurts is what they're called. Um, they don't assimilate with China. Um, and so they're kind of ignorant of what is going on in China. And a lot of these foreign officials they brought in to um, to run the government for them, be they Marco Polo or Arabs from the other places or Persians, they understand, they kind of like, oh my gosh, the Mongols are not really paying attention to the taxes we're collecting. And so let's skim a little bit off the top for ourselves. And so these foreign um, bureaucrats that are brought in become corrupt. And so the Mongols are like, the, the Mongols turn around and like, well, where's all our tax dollars? And these foreign bureaucrats are like, I don't know, even though they're secretly pocketing it. Um, and so the Mongols are like, well, you better raise taxes because we, we're here for money. And so taxes just keep going up and up and up because we have these foreign officials who are corrupt. And also these foreign officials don't really care about the longevity and the success of China because they're not Chinese. And so they don't maintain the levees, and so there's more floods in China. They don't maintain the granaries, and so when there's times of drought, there's mass starvation. And so the people of China are getting really angry. Right? The government is not doing its job. It's not looking out for the people, um, which is a traditional Confucian ideology. Um, and also the taxes are really high, and so the people are getting angry. And we see peasant rebellion after peasant rebellion, right? In addition to that, um, the Mongols are not paying attention to the running of the government, and so we run out of gold and, um, and silver, um, and so this paper money becomes, has been successful in China, becomes less and less useful, because in order for paper money to work, you have to have at least some gold and silver that gives people confidence that the paper means something, um, but now we're kind of running out of that because of inattention to detail by these foreign bureaucrats, and so the economy starts to break down, right? Now, fueling anger in China at this time are those Confucian scholars because they are mad. They, they lost their power and status and privilege in China to these foreign Yuan, these foreign Mongols and these foreign bureaucrats and they want to go back, right? They want to go back to the past where we had Chinese in charge and we had Confucians in charge. And so we see these Confucianists, they're starting to fuel discontent among the population. Like, you know, remember the good old days when, when we didn't have starvation and we didn't have heavy taxes? Oh, we should really get these foreigners out and bring Confucianism back. And so they're kind of stirring the pot a little bit, these Confucian scholars. In addition, we see that these once um, invincible, powerful Mongols are starting to lose their credibility and their legitimacy because the Mongols wanted to continue their conquering and they're kind of running out of Asia to conquer. And so they see Japan across the sea. And so the Mongols are like, well, let's go conquer Japan. And so they built this huge fleet of ships. Now, they don't know anything about ships. They're, they're nomadic pastoralists from Central Asia. But they build these, this huge armada of ships, and they're going to go use these ships to transport all their horses um, to Japan and conquer Japan. But then there's this huge tsunami. There's this huge, um, um, you know, not tsunami. There's this huge hurricane, um, and it um, wipes out, right, this fleet. Um, and so in Japan, they th they're celebrating because they think that their nature spirits, remember Japan is Shinto, they think that the wind spirit, the kamikaze, has saved Japan from this invading foe. Um, and so, you know, Japan is very happy that their gods protected them, the, the kazi kami, um, this wind spirit. And in China, this once invincible, powerful, 
Mongol Empire looks like, wow, the, the, the heavens don't support it, the gods don't support them, so maybe it's time to rebel. Maybe the Confucian scholars are right. Maybe this is a weak empire and we should rebel. And so we have this really big peasant uprising. It's called the Red Turban Rebellion around 1360. And so you know, millions of peasants rise up in rebellion, and the Mongols just decide, well, who needs it? Right? Oh, we were much happier when we were just riding our horses and conquering back in Central Asia. Who needs the headache of running China and putting these peasant rebellions down? We're here for money, not to spend money to put rebe rebellions down. And so they're partially pushed out, the Mongols, and they partially just leave. And so that ends the Yuan Dynasty. They just, like, forget it, right? And so that, that ends the Yuan Dynasty, and then we're going to see the Yuan replaced with the Ming Dynasty. And I know these dynasties can get confusing, but really, if you know the dynasties, you can understand Chinese political history. So, so far in these notes, we've gone from Song, which is Chinese, and then we go to Yuan, which are the Mongols, and then back to the Ming, which are Chinese again. So it's kind of like a, a Mongol sandwich, if you will. Um, not being disrespectful at all, it's just, a, it's just a way to remember it. We go Chinese, Yuan, Chinese. Song, Yuan, Ming. And so they can get kind of confusing, but that's how we can try to remember it, right? And so if you're the Ming dynasty, you're Chinese, and so you want to get rid of anything foreign, right? They want to say, let's make China great again. And to do that, we're going to embrace Neo-Confucianism again. We're going to embrace all filial piety, ancestor veneration. We're going to put the Confucian scholars back in charge. Um, anything that is traditionally Chinese, we're going to embrace. And anything that is foreign, like those Yuan or those foreign bureaucrats, we're going to get rid of, right? And so we're going back to very traditional Chinese ideas. So the Ming are going to reestablish traditional Chinese ideas, so they reestablish the civil servant system. And so those upper level mandarins are very happy, um, and so they're going to get their jobs back, and so we're going to see Confucianism from the village level all the way up to the provincial level. Right. Um, next, we're going to expel all those foreigners. And so either you leave or die. And so we're going to see all those foreigners just leave mass exodus of China. In addition to that, we're going to see all their, their mosques destroyed. We're going to see their Christian churches destroyed. Um, you know, all of these foreign faiths, they're foreign, so they have to go. Um, and so we're going to back to all things Chinese. Right. Next. The Great Wall has been, it was built a long time ago, way before our course started, um, but it's fallen into disrepair because, of course, the Yuan Dynasty, the Mongols, they had no reason to keep repairing and manning the Great Wall. The Great Wall was built by the Chinese to keep out nomads from Central Asia, like the Mongols in this case. Um, and so the Mongols didn't keep it repaired. And so the Ming Dynasty, obviously, they want to keep the, the, the Mongols from coming back. And so they're going to repair the Great Wall, extend it in some areas, um, man it again to keep those foreigners, those Mongols, out. Right? And so we see a restoration of the Great Wall. Right? Um, now, so the Ming are very happy to be back in charge. They're Chinese. Um, but what they're afraid of is that, you know, we got these foreigners out um, and we're going to place Confucians back in charge of the provinces. But we're a little scared of the Confucianists because as they showed during the Yuan Dynasty, they can stir up trouble and they can try to get the people going and they can try to get the people to overthrow a dynasty. Um, and so let's not put too much power in the hands of the Confucian bureaucrats. And so at the very, very highest level, at the, you know, the, the, not the provincial level, but even higher than that, the people that are um, advising um, the emperor himself, we're going to use more of what we call eunuchs. So a eunuch is a trained bureaucrat who um, is very educated and intellectual, but he cannot build up a power base from generation to generation like some of the Confucian scholars can um, because they can't have children. They've, been, um, they've, they've had their reproductive parts um, cut off. Um, and so they just can't, and when they were young boys, and so they physically cannot sire children. And so this makes them perfect for the Ming because um, they're afraid that the Confucianists, who were not um, castrated, um, they, they can pass all their power and status and privilege onto their son, who can gather more status and power and privilege and pass it on to his son. And so over time, these Confucian Mandarin scholars can become very powerful and build a lot of money and wealth.
Well, when a eunuch dies, he has no son to pass it on to because he couldn't have a son. And so all of his power and money and privilege remains with the Ming, remains with the state. And so we're going to see the Ming, this is a bit of a change. They're going to use eunuchs more than any other dynasty has used so far at the highest levels. So that's a little bit of a change. All right. So um, next, let's talk about the, the treasure fleets. And so the Ming dynasty is very famous for using these big fleets of ships that will go out and reassert Chinese rule, right? We're proud to be Chinese again, that we've gotten rid of the foreigners, and we want the world to know that the Chinese, they're back, right? Um, and so what they do is they build these huge fleets of junks, these huge ships, right? And we're, our, in, our desire is not to go conquer the world, but let the know, world know who's boss, right? That we're back. We're no longer controlled by foreigners. We are back with a vengeance. We've made China great again. And so as you can see here, over the years, these huge fleets of Chinese uh, ships, they go to Southeast Asia and they say, okay, we're not here to conquer, but we are here to let you know that you have to bow to us. And that bowing is called kowtowing, right? Um, and it's just a form of respect, and you should know this, right? And so when you bend, you kneel, and you and you bend, and you put your forehead to the floor when one of these Chinese fleet comes in, you're symbolically, physically, publicly saying that the Chinese are mightier than you, and we owe them tribute. Now, it's not taxes, right? Well, the Chinese are not coming and conquering these areas. Um, taxes are a day-to-day -day thing. It's tribute. Once a year, we're going to come back, and you have to let everybody know that we're in, that we're more powerful than you. Kowtow to us, and we'll collect our tribute, right? And so these treasure fleets don't just go to Southeast Asia, but they'll eventually go to South Asia, and they'll eventually go to East Africa and parts of Southwest Asia, establishing their dominance over this part of the world. Again, not conquering, but saying that we're powerful than you, and the, the rulers of these areas have to kowtow and say, yes, you are more powerful than me. And so this is very you know empowering for the Chinese to know that all of the people in the known world, they're known world, have bowed to them and have given them tribute. And so that's part of the reason we do these treasure fleets. But another part of the reason we do these, these treasure fleets is to once again open up trade contacts, right? Maritime trade contacts. Because the Silk Roads have always been going on, um, but, but we see that the Yuan were not that interested in maritime trade because they're an overland empire. And so now that China is back, we want to reestablish our maritime trade contacts. And as we send ships every year to these different places, well now maritime, Chinese maritime trade is going to come back. And so we're going to see goods traded back and forth forth in the Indian Ocean, and a lot more of them are going to be headed to China because we have these big fleets that the government's sponsoring to bring them back to China. And so this makes the Ming Empire powerful, not just at home, but abroad. And it also makes them powerful economically because we can tax all of these trade goods, these luxury goods that are coming into China. Here's a great example of this. This is a carving that can be found in China. And so here are the Ming rulers. And what we see here is, um, you know, a giraffe. And so this is evidence that we know these treasure fleets happened. Here are the boats back here. And they brought in goods all the way from Africa back to China. And so it's a great example of a physical um, relic that shows us that these treasure fleets happened, right? So it also is going to spread Chinese luxury goods to other places. And so, again, as we've seen in the past slide with Silk Road trade, maritime trade is going to bring Chinese goods into Southwest Asia, Southeast Asia, East Africa, South Asia. Um, and so the compass and paper and all of these ideas are not just spreading across the Silk Roads, but they're also spreading in maritime trade. Right? Now, eventually, in 1424, these treasure fleets suddenly stop. Right? Um, and why do they do this? Um, because every year these treasure fleets go further and further and further away from China to establish trade contacts and dominance. Um, and so why do they do this? Um, they do it because as the, there's several reasons. One is that as the Chinese go to all these other places, they're like, well, there is no other big, huge, powerful empire like us out there. I mean, there are empires, but nothing we would consider on our level. We're more technologically advanced. We have better trade goods. So what's the point in going out there? Let's just everybody, let everybody come to us. Why are we taking the expense of building these ships going to them? They all know we have goods. We've spread it to them. They all know we have amazing luxury goods. Let them come to us. Why are we spending the money? So that's one reason they stopped the luxury, these treasure fleets. Another reason is, 
is um, that they just start to run out of money, right? The Mongols up here are making noise again that they might invade, and so we need to spend money maintaining that wall, right? So let's not spend money on these ships. It's nice, but let's not spend money on these ships. If there's something we need more definite, and I just can't go higher where the wall actually is because <laughs> my pen won't go that high, right? And so we need to spend money on keeping those Mongols out, right? Um, we only have so much money, and so we're going to have to do that. And then another reason is environmental. Um, these these, these junks are made from bamboo to a large extent, um, and they've just we've just cut down entire forests in China to build these huge fleets. That's how big these fleets are, and we just run out of bamboo. Um, and so the government says, well, we can't really afford to do this. We have to also focus on keeping the Mongols out. We didn't find anybody that really um, is, is overawing to us. Everybody just wants our goods anyway. Let them come to us. And so in 1424, they just stop these treasure fleets. And that's really interesting because we can play the kind of what-if game here, right? China was sending out more and more and more of these ships. And if they would have continued this, maybe they would have rounded Africa's cape and started to explore West Africa. Or maybe they would have made their way to Europe. Or maybe they would have made their way to the New World. They certainly had the technology to do it with compasses and latine sails and these big ships. Um, and so maybe world history would have been quite a bit different if China, if China had conquered the world and, and explored um, and set the new world up. Um, you know, maybe we would all be speaking Mandarin today. Who knows? But they didn't, right? They shut down this exploration and this these treasure fleets in 1424. What's interesting is when we get to Europe, at about this time, the Portuguese are starting to go out and explore. And we see that Europe will then follow suit. And so we see this kind of rise and fall, as it were. We see the Chinese start to become more inward facing and not really engaging the rest of the world. They just want the world to come to them. But Europe is going out and engaging the world at just the same time. And so we start to see the rise of Europe on the world stage, just as the Chinese start to focus on themselves, the Europeans set out explorers and focus and start to find the rest of the world. And we'll certainly talk a lot more about that in the next time period of this course that goes from 1450 to 1750, the age of exploration, European exploration. So an interesting turning point here in world history. All right, so let's now do the learning objectives. So number five, analyze the impact of the Golden Horde on Eastern Europe. And really what I'm getting at here is one, it connects Russia to the Silk Roads, um, but it also kind of unifies and centralizes Russia and, and unknowingly, unwittingly, the Mongols help to kind of create some centralization in Russia and eventually the Russians will rise up under the Prince of Moscow and drive out the Mongols. Next, number six, describe how the Ilkhanate of Persia was governed. We had talked about how they, the, the Mongols come in and they try to rule um, and put Mongols in charge of provinces, but to, to get legitimacy, they um, become Muslim, right? Um, and so that they, they start to learn Arabic, right? Um, and they start to become Muslim and they start to adapt the culture of the people they have conquered. Um, and then eventually, so that's an example of cultural diffusion. Um, but eventually they start to break down because they introduce paper money and that is not something that these people are used to. And they, the Mongols had adopted um, Muslim practices of having a harem and that made to all kinds of succession disputes. And so we see um, cultural diffusion happening and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't and empires break down. All right. Number seven, to what extent did cultural diffusion occur in the Yuan dynasty? Um, and of course it did. It always does, but not as much as you would think, because remember the Mongols um, said we're going to keep ourselves separate from the Chinese because we think we're superior. But to some extent it did, right? Because we bring in all of these new cultures, new faiths, new peoples to govern parts of China at this time. All right. Eight, analyze the reason for the decline of the Yuan. We had said that the Yuan really weren't paying attention to administration. They put these foreigners in charge and the foreigners became corrupt. Taxes went up. Um, the people rebelled. We had also seen that the Confucian scholars were trying to stir up a rebellion. Um, and then that the Chinese, that the Mongols, sorry, the Mongols looked weak when they had this big failed invasion of Japan. Number nine, how did the Ming dynasty govern their state? And remember, Ming are Chinese again, and so they're going to reestablish Confucian scholars. They're also going to start to use eunuchs at the highest levels, um, and so they're going to try to return to all things Chinese that are traditionally Chinese. 
And number 10, analyze how the Ming Dynasty increased trade. This is the, these are the treasure fleets, right? Going out there and reasserting Chinese dominance in the maritime trade area, right? And explain why they stopped. And we just talked about that. Um, it got too expensive. They needed to protect the frontier. Um, they just realized people would come to them. Um, they ran out of bamboo. And so these are all reasons that we had talked about where they stopped the treasure fleets. And that is it for this lecture.